Can I first uh, begin by thanking the President and his team for my invitation to return here uh, this evening, especially in your 200th year. Tony Benn almost believed that people in positions of power, be that in the spheres of the economy or politics, should be asked five questions. What power have you got? Where did you get it from? In whose interest do you exercise it? To whom are you accountable? And how do we get rid of you? <laughs> My purpose tonight in a short contribution is to make some comments on the third, in whose interests do you exercise it? Tony's favourite was always the fifth. Power in our society rests in several fields. Most important, as the first speech from the opposition indicated, are the main levers of the economy. The ownership and control of the means of production Closely related to that is a sphere of politics alongside such institutions as the civil service, the judiciary, the armed forces, and so on. Marxists argue that in a class society based on the market, that is capitalism, the main cl classes are those that comprise the ownership and the control of production, the ruling class, and those who only sell their labor power, the working class. Now the first is tiny perhaps tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands at the very most, though membership is to a certain extent subjective. I once remember accusing Nick Soames, now Lord Soames, along with other Tory MPs, of being representatives of the ruling class. And he gave me a withering look and said, dear boy, I am the ruling class. <laughs> he was, as I'm sure you're aware, Churchill's grandson and a close friend of the King. The main class in society, however, is the working class. It's huge, of the order of some 50 million people, with a third smaller middle class of perhaps 5 to 10 million in between. So the trick of the ruling class is how to mould British politics to act in the interests of such a numerically small section of society. One illustration of the numbers, by the way, is that of wealth. The uh, Office of National Statistics, the ONS, uh, indicates that the richest 1% of the UK population, some 700,000 people, have a total wealth of almost £3,000 billion, which is more than the £2,500 billion shared by 70% of the population, some 48 million people. No doubt this Sunday, the Sunday Times, might be next week actually, uh, will tell us how much the UK's 171 billionaires have increased their share. And it's that disparity between the rich and the rest inherent in a capitalist system. Now, it wasn't always the case. 50 years ago, this was one of the more equal countries on the planet, with the gap between the rich and the rest at the narrowest it had been in the 20th century. Roughly 65% of the country's annual output in 1973 went to working class families, based on a number of factors, not least a much larger trade union movement. With, with respect to the short speech, so forgive me. After Margaret Thatcher and a succession of prime ministers who have essentially maintained her path, that proportion is now 50% of GDP. In today's figures, it's a transfer of some £300 billion a year from ordinary families to the richest layers of society. Frankly, maintaining that disparity, the power and the privilege of an elite section of society, maintaining the structures which keeps that disparity in place, is the job of a politics that represents the interests of the ruling class. And where that role is, uh, in particular, uh, is institutions, uh, as my colleague began her speech, such as in private education and in Oxbridge. To provide a homogeneity of outlook, a cohesiveness of shared values, and in essence defence of the status quo, the continued existence of that unequal society against any ideological or organisational challenge. In politics, unfortunately not time to make the same points about business law or the armed forces, Members of Parliament largely share these values by being, as, as was outlined, disproportionately drawn from private schools followed by Oxbridge or Russell universities. 29% of current MPs went to private schools, but for Tory MPs the figure is 
Three quarters of all MPs, 500 of them, went to Oxbridge or Russell universities. And as I'm sure you're aware, every Prime Minister of the last 75 years who went to a university came to Oxford, except, I think, for Gordon Brown. Now, the figures for MPs have changed over time. 40 years ago, it was 73% of Tory MPs that were privately educated, compared to 41% today. For Labour MPs, the decline is less so, from 18% Fourteen percent. Conversely, whilst the number of Tory MPs who came to Oxford or Cambridge fell over the 40-year period, the percentage of Labour MPs rose. It's arguable that the British elite's talent base has expanded as more MPs are drawn in who naturally defend the current market system, not fundamentally challenge it. Well, Tony's fifth question still remains, however, and what we're going to do about it. Because whilst we have a market economy, capitalism, and it remains the foundation of our society, that system and the elite who mainly benefit from it will seek to bring on the next generation who will maintain it. So from the point of view of the maintenance of that form of society, it doesn't essentially matter if the next set of controllers come from a land-based old money strata of society or something newer, as long as the essentials are maintained. That's why the establishment hated Jeremy Corbyn so much, for the radical policies of change he represented, which gained the support of millions. But that same establishment is politically relaxed about a Labour leadership as long as it's wedded to the profit system. 21 years ago, at a Conservative fundraising dinner in Hampshire, Margaret Thatcher was asked, what was her greatest achievement? She answered, Tony Blair and New Labour. We forced our opponents to change their minds. That success from the establishment's point of view, a reliable second 11 to take over when the preferred government is in distress, is matched again today, with the sharp move to the right of the leadership of the Labour opposition and the essential overlapping of key policies. What in the 1950s was called butskillism for Rab Butler and Hugh Gateskill. Concocting a similar portmanteau today is a little more difficult between Rachel Reeves and Jeremy Hunt. But their attitudes to protecting the relatively low rates of tax on serious wealth or the extent within the economy of planned public ownership, there is a shared agenda. And a strategy similar to that which Peter Manderson described in 1996, the year before Tony Blair won the election, as to move forward from where Margaret Thatcher left off. I'm coming to an end with, with regret. And which will no doubt provide a seamless transition at the next election in the same way as Gordon Brown's initial adoption of an extremely conservative fiscal policy, in essence the continuity of the policy of Ken Clark of which Ken Clark said later, such was the unpopularity of the Tory government in 1997, he would never have got away with. A Labour challenge under Jeremy Corbyn was different, was radical, from the abolition of tuition fees to the public ownership of essential industries, and in 2017 brought the largest rise in the popular vote for any political party since Clem Attlee 70 years earlier. It was a brief period when Labour really was seen, paraphrasing Shelley, as for the many, not the few, fundamentally different from the Tories and defying a political alternative for the working class. That period, the Corbyn experiment inside the Labour Party, is decisively over. As Keir Starmer said yesterday at the British Chambers of Commerce Global Annual Conference, the three years where he and Rachel Reeves have had meetings with each and every one of the CEOs of the 250 largest businesses in this country, Labour is now not just a pro-business party, we're a party that is proud of being pro-business. Or Wes Streeting last week who told nurses to get over their cultural sniffiness about the role of profit in the national health services. So my contention finally that those of us who want to see classes defining British politics, who want to see a socialist, anti-austerity political agenda that talks unashamedly about planning and public ownership and the transfer of wealth far more equally across society, so that class does define politics, 
are in the same period to the last quarter of the 19th century when radicals looked at the Liberals and Tories and saw no essential difference and decided they had to start afresh and build a new political voice for working people. That's our job today, not an easy one, but one that can only be successful if a new party is rooted in the organisations and communities of the working class. So do we live in a country where your socio-economic background dictates your policies, which was the question posed in the invitation I received to tonight's debate? My argument, it's the class interests which dominate politics, but the political choice which currently is on offer is one which is skewed towards the interests of the minority, capital-owning class within society, not the majority. Our side isn't currently on the pitch. Something new needs to be built so that the working class can define British politics in its favour and end the one-sided interests of the ruling class which currently define British politics. I support the motion.